value from success, growth, and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is David Skarika, founder of the Addicted to Profits newsletter online at addictedtoprofits.net. He also writes for the Financial Intelligence Report. He's speaking to us from the glorious Bahamas. Welcome back to the show, David. Uh, Thanks for having me. David, how long can the bubble that's uh, growing, especially for the S&P and NASDAQ, continue? I, I don't know. Obviously, there's a, there's a bunch of factors that have led to this. The number one thing is just liquidity, right? There's, there's three major ones. Liquidity is the first factor. So, look, what's happened is, you know, they've printed trillions of dollars. The, you know, rates are zero. So that money has to flow somewhere. So it's kind of flowed into, you know, these tech stocks that have some growth. But even, like, you know, the Dow is at a new high. The S&P has a new high. And some of that is just a relative dividend or income play. Because, you know, you can still get whatever, 2% on your dividend in the S&P or the Dow, and you're getting a half a percent roughly on the 10-year bond, and you're getting 0% on a, a short-term bond. So some some uh, funds may be moving to that just because they can get a little bit of an income from stocks, right? And then, um, uh, so, so that would be uh, the part of it. Yeah, again, you get this money sloshing around, and where is it going to go, right? And a lot of it would go into financial assets. Financial stocks, obviously gold has been a beneficiary of that as well, right? Um, so that, that's part of it. Then I think the, the second um, uh, a factor is these tech stocks that's kind of led this rally, you know, the Microsofts, the Apples, the Amazons, Teslas, et cetera, they kind of are beneficiaries. And then like SD, Etsy or um, uh, a smaller name, Zoom, because, you know, these are the things that people are using when they're kind of stuck at home, right? You know, people are doing Zoom meet- meetings instead of, like, you know, traveling and doing meetings, right? And um, and there is somewhat, I think, of a secular shift. There's a shift, uh, to, um, uh, sorry, with these things. Like, you look at uh, Zoom, uh, we're seeing evidence that a lot of cities, due to like, COVID and maybe some of the violence and the protests, um, are emptying out in the United States. And what's going to happen is, um, uh, people are going to, you know, maybe stay at their house in the suburbs and just use the Zoom thing for their meetings. And, you know, that, that you know, if, if um, these big office buildings and these major centers are going to be half empty, that benefits Zoom longer term, right? So there is a little bit of, you know, a strategic and long-term secular shift in that. But it also in the short term, it's like these are the companies that have benefited. Perfect example is, Target is not a company you would consider to be like a leading online company. But their last earnings were very strong because they do have Target.com. You can order things online. Whereas maybe you would go to a smaller mom and pop shop for some of that stuff. They're all shut down. So it kind of forces you to go, you know, to Target online. And then if Target, say, had some of their stores shut down during, you know, um, um, uh, some of the COVID lockdowns, well, probably the margins are higher on the stuff they're selling online than in the store, which has, you know, rent and, and utilities and, and, and um, uh, uh, paying people salaries, et cetera. So that's the second thing that, yeah, they, they, these, these stocks that I call them like COVID plays and, and, that, and that sort of thing, these stocks which have, um, um, you know, benefited from the pandemic have also, you've seen the money like flush into them. And then the third one, and we've talked about this in the past, is, you know, with these overinflated um, um, uh, bailouts and unemployment and, um, you know, a lot of people making salaries without having to work. Like, remember, when they bailed out the airlines in the States, it didn't just go to the fat cat. The airlines were allowed to pay all their employees, you know, for six months with that money, with many of them not working because, you know, the capacity in, in uh, the airlines uh, and the number of flights is so much lower. So people had a lot of this excess money and were sitting around at home, 
and they just started playing the, you know, like uh, the stock market. Like the guy who's the CEO of Barstool, um, Dave Portnoy is kind of the poster boy for that. And cause he started trading stocks because Dave is a self-admitted huge gambler and he had nothing to gamble on. So he started day trading the stock market. And I think a lot of millennials who are probably making as much or even more with all of these unemployment benefits, um, um, but we're, we're, you know, I've been, uh, trading and they tend to, again, gravitate to those kind of companies. You know, the Apples and the Amazons and then Netflixes and Teslas. So I think those three factors of all of this kind of excess money in both terms of just pure monetary printing and these overinflated unemployment, uh, benefits have led to this slush of money falling into the stock market. But it's made it really dangerous because right now, there's a, there's a famous indicator that Warren Buffett follows and it's kind of known as the Buffett indicator. It's just the market cap to GDP. So it takes the total market cap divided by the GDP and historically it's about 70%, meaning that you know, the stock market is roughly two-thirds or three-quarters the size of the economy. Well, when it gets over 100%, that's a real extreme. That happened in 2000, it happened in 2007, it happened in the last few years before um, the market kind of tanked in the first quarter of this year. Well, now it's not an all-time high, even higher than the 2000 bubble when it had its previous all-time high. And the reason being is the economy has shrunk a great deal, and then everything has come back. Uh, you know, in the market, but the economy is still way below where it was in February of 2020. So um, the market is really overvalued. And, like, I know a lot of people look at PDEs, but a lot of people don't look at price to sales. Like, for example, Apple, which has about... 260, 270 billion in sales a year has a market cap of 2.2 trillion, meaning it's trading at about eight times sales, which is a gigantic number. Most companies tend to trade at one to two times sales, and like eight times sales is for a super high growth company, which Apple is not anymore. Uh, Microsoft trades at almost 10 times sales. So we're just seeing these are really excess valuations, and then also in technical terms, we have something called a parabolic chart, which is you know, when a chart goes straight up, it almost always goes straight back down. And um, some people also call it a skyscraper chart. And if you go look at a lot of these, again, these tech companies, and I'm talking you have to look at a longer-term chart going back, say, 10 or 20 years, and this is what happened to a lot of them back in 2000 when they didn't collapse. They all look like that as well. So it's, you know, there's a, you know, the problem with shorting is you can lose more money than you put in, and like when you buy a stock, you can only lose all the money you put in unless you're, you know, hyped up on margin. Um, so the problem is right now is the market, as the old saying goes, can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. So who knows when is this going to end? Um, because everything is such an extreme, and it keeps going extreme. And me, I do do some shorting in terms of put options because, what I like about options is you can only lose the money you put in on, like, actually shorting a stock. And um, and I just use it more as a hedge to my long position. And I know I've been very reluctant. I, I put it on a few positions in August. But I've been very reluctant to go heavy into the puts just because the market just keeps going up, up, and up, you know. We'll have more with David Skarika right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with David Skarika. David, are people seeking gold not just because it's gone up in price, but because they just don't trust the banks as a store of wealth anymore? Um, uh, well, uh, I don't know about the bank stocks themselves. They will probably have some problems because of the issues they're going to have with mortgages. 
I think gold has more to do with currency than banks. Um, it's not like people are buying gold bars and putting them in their house, right, rather than uh, putting money in the bank. I think it's more to do just with, you know, you, you go look at the U.S. dollars and very poorly over the last few months. But it's like, you know, back in the 70s when the U.S. dollar did poorly, you had like the, the, the Swiss franc and even the French franc. Uh, France actually had pretty strong um, um, fiscal uh, policy back in the 70s, uh, small deficits and, and um, uh, a, a trade surplus, this sort of thing. You had these kind of strong currencies on top of gold uh, in the 70s, right? And the dollar was just kind of going uh, down against everything in the 70s because it was weaker than a lot of these currencies. And the perfect example is you know, just fundamentally weak in the 70s, even though commodities went up, the Canadian dollar went down against the American dollar, which in turn went down against almost everything else. But what I'm saying is I think back then you, you had these strong currencies. The yen was a classic example. For years, Japan had higher real rates, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, in a strong economy. So it was as actually seen as kind of maybe a, a, you know, a much stronger currency to put your money into. But now, even though the dollar is going down against a lot of currencies, it's kind of like they're all crap, right? Like the euro has, you know, they have political problems in Europe. They have zero rates. They have big debts and deficits there. In Canada's deficit is out of control, just like the states. You know, it's, it's rallied. So what it is, I think, is that people just, and all the rates in these places are like zero, right? So people are just like, well, the rates are all zero. All of these countries really have big debt and deficit problems. So i just rather put my money into gold and precious metals. You know, and Bitcoin even is 12000 as well. So I think even cryptocurrencies benefit from that as well. So I just think it's more alternatives because these currencies in this kind of fiat, fiat back, the back system are just all looking like really, really weak. And look, what, what, why would you buy a currency over gold in the past? Well, you know, in the early 80s when gold topped, you could get a bond in the U.K. or the U.S. or Canada, and it, it could yield, you know, 15% on a 10-year bond at that time. So you were getting some really good income on your money. And, of course, in the 80s, as inflation uh, declined, that 15% a year became worth, you know, even more uh, in real terms. But now that's not the case. You know, you buy a bond in any of these places, you're getting nothing. And the big issue now, again, going back to the debt, the debts are so huge. Like in the U.S., it's 153% of GDP if you include all the states and local governments. In Canada, if you include the provinces along with the federal government, it's 120% of GDP. These are like the Italian Greece levels that we saw when these countries had crises back in, you know, 2012 or so. So, so the thing is, you look at those huge debts combined with uh, uh, low rates, and the rates can't go up because these countries will be bankrupt then. Because if, if, if that's why if Japan has tried to, you know, subdue their rates for decades, because once you get to 100, 150, 200 percent of GDP debt, you can't have two, three, four percent uh, rates on the ten-year bond because the interest expenditure will take up the entire government budget or a lot of the government budget. So. Rates can't, you got rates can't going up, tons of printing, tons of debt. I think that's really the alternative to gold, uh, more than banks. Now I know that, um, um, Warren Buffett sold some banks and he bought, uh, Barrick, but, um, and so maybe you could say he's doing that, but I think he's just looking at which potentially has the safer stream of income. Banks, which can't make any money off their loans, right, and, um, may have to cut those dividends because they're not going to have the cash flow, or Barrick, which now has a business that's going to generate positive cash flow, you know, at 1900 2000 and maybe ultimately higher gold prices. We'll have more with David Skrika right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with David Skarika. David, 
the U.S. report on payroll numbers not all that positive? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, th- what people have to understand is, you know, we know about the jobs reports that come out the first Friday of every month. Well, before that, on Wednesday in the United States, they re- re- release uh, private payrolls, which doesn't, by the way, include job losses. It, it just basically shows you the number of jobs kind of created in the private sector. So, again, because cut private, doesn't include government jobs, etc. And they were supposed to come out at 1.7 million, and they only came out around four or 500,000. And I think one of the big issues is we're just not seeing these service jobs. Like, actually, this is an interesting thing to talk about. It doesn't have much to do with investing, but we're the issues they're going to have um, in the economy that, you know, these restaurants need, for example, 80% capacity, really a restaurant, to, to be cash flow positive and make money. And they can't make money just doing takeout because, you know, they need to sell booze, which they have a big markup on, and, and uh, you know, they, they get the tips, you know, for the people working there, et cetera. And um, it, it's, it's, so these restaurants remain empty, and they only allow outdoor seating. And then what are they going to do in, like, some of the northeastern states or in Canada when the winter comes and you can't really have outdoor seating in a few months? Um, and I was reading a really interesting article about Austin, Texas, which has kind of come, you know, probably with New Orleans, kind of the music capital of, um, um, and maybe Nashville as well, of, of um, the United States, right, in terms of the city and, and their lifestyle. And a lot of these, they're expecting that if they can't, by, say, the end of this year, um, uh, you know, get, start getting capacity back in those restaurants and bars in, in Austin, they're saying that 50 to 75% of those places will basically go out of business. And... With that happening so quickly, I don't see just when COVID is over, say in a year or two, people just wanting to fork over a bunch of money to restart again. A lot of people won't have the money. They'll be very reluctant to do it because they just experience uh, mass bankruptcies and this sort of thing in the economy. So I think part of the issue with these payroll numbers is with restaurants not able to go back to, you know, uh, to full uh, work, that's where a lot of people work in restaurants shopping mall, service-type job. And I think this is going to be the issue with the structural unemployment the next three to five years is, you know, that those jobs I don't think are coming back. So, and again, that's where maybe, the, you, again, you look at kind of the lunacy of the stock market, it doesn't really seem to be discounting much of that, you know? Well, uh, take a look at uh, the tourism industry, the cruise ships. Uh, Miami lives on cruise ships. Vancouver's downtown lives on cruise ships on the summer. Uh, without cruise ship business, a lot of these ports are, are seeing the small shops that surround them close, and will they open again? Like, I live in the Bahamas, and in the Bahamas, especially in Nassau, they see more tourists uh, visit via cruise ships than they do via air or, and, and stay in hotels, you know, because the cruise ships come in every day. Thousands of people go into uh, to the, you know, the downtown Nassau, and they, you know, even if they just buy a couple trinkets, it's like, that adds up to someone spending 10 or $20 when they get off the ship. And like you said, um, I, you know, I've seen that. And by the way, I see that firsthand because I live in my house. I'm on, I'm elevated about 150 feet. And I, and the, the, the path of the cruise ships that go from Miami, like you're talking about, into the rest of the Caribbean, they have to go around the Bahamas and the Atlantic because if you went through that part of the Caribbean, it's too shallow for them, especially at low tide. So they all have to go around. And, you know, I'd always see uh, at night and during the day a couple cruise ships in my view, and I have not seen a cruise ship in four or five months, right? And it's just like that industry is totally dead, and that, as that is one of the, you know, because of uh, all the circulated air and people in closed spaces, cruise ships are one of the worst places to be, you know, in terms of spreading of uh, COVID. So that's an industry I just cannot see really coming back, and I don't even care if they get a vaccine or they – or, or um, you have mass testing, or even the, the COVID goes away. I just think that industry, people are kind of psychologically damaged. Uh, their view is damaged towards, right? They're not going to want to go. And just like, you know, the air travel was way down after 9-11 for years because people were scared to get in the plane thinking, you know, there could be a terrorist attack in a plane. Um, I think the cruise ship industry is kind of the same way. Like, people are just going to... Uh, uh, shy away from it. And by the way, I think that's also the future of tourism. Um, if you want to talk about, you know, some business opportunities, I don't know 
maybe Airbnb also maybe will benefit from this as well. But the problem is Airbnb, a lot of the rentals are in cities. I think people are going to want to go to smaller resorts, uh, rent houses in kind of more pristine, you know, maybe, you know, out of, uh, out of the beaten path places rather than, you know, going to a casino in Vegas or, you know, or, or a big resort in Jamaica or even the Bahamas. They're going to look for more boutique style stuff because after COVID, I just think there's going to be this more of this reluctance to be in big crowds and that sort of thing. And also if, with all the, again, the kind of the deterioration in a lot of cities due to, you know, COVID and, and, and this is more of a United States factor than Canada, but due to kind of, you know, the, these riots and protests, people, when they do go away, they're going to want to get away from everything, not go to some packed casino somewhere, right? So I think that's another aspect that will be interesting towards the economy. And the, the problem with that kind of shift in tourism that kind of gets rid of this big, mega mass tourism makes everything more smaller in boutique and and that would mean that you know like you said like downtown vancouver or like a place in the bahamas which is dependent on tourism it probably means less jobs ultimately like it may mean it, like you know maybe you know just mean like smaller places hiring smaller amounts of people so i think there's all these aspects that we're not kind of looking at here. I think right now, everyone is so short-term and orientated because they're just looking through, let's get through the whole COVID thing. And then I think people expect things to return to normal, but I don't think it is. I just think the damage has been so severe economically to all these service and tourist businesses. It's just something that's damaged for, you know, five or 10 years kind of thing. So, um, which again, if you want to look at the positive, I think ultimately that's, really good for precious metals, you know, because um, that means these debt and deficits are here to stay, and um, probably, you know, if they try to suppress interest rates, it's only whether that be afford, uh, to try to afford more spending. And remember, that's what Japan has done in the last 20 years. Japan, because they couldn't grow their economy organically, they would just keep building, you know, the famous roads to nowhere, bridges to nowhere. And uh, I think that's ultimately where we might be headed always having to do public work uh, projects that try to keep people in, uh, employed, et cetera, which is good for gold, by the way, in two ways, just to finish that off. Number one, obviously, the bigger uh, debts and deficits it costs to pay for that. And number two, you know, when you're buying cement or copper or steel or whatever to build these projects, well, that, that creates demand for them, which is, you know, uh, pushes the prices up, which is inflationary. David, how would you sum up what's going on right now? Is there any kind of word you can use or a few words? Uh, right now, I think we're getting near the inflection point of the stock market. Now, I know I said it's very difficult to time, and I'm not really trying to time it. But one thing I have been doing is I have done well in a, bit, a lot of gold and silver uh, deals and, and companies. I've taken you know uh, some money off the table, kind of just waiting for some kind of correction. Because in these corrections, like we saw in March, Sometimes the gold and silver shares do tend to fall with the market. And I think actually one of the inflection points might be the election, regardless who wins, because right now everybody's trying to bribe voters, right? The extra unemployment, all of these stimulus projects, because everyone, you know, like, like Biden and Trump both want to win. And I think after the election, and um, uh, then you'll see those kind of go a bit by the wayside. And I think both even... Uh, even as far left as the Democrats have gone, they know that these you know, excess uh, uh, unemployment benefits, you just can't afford them. You can't be running these $5 trillion, $6 trillion deficits every year. And I think once that kind of artificial stimulus begins to wear off, and it will probably no matter who wins the election, because then the next guy, then that person won't be trying to get elected, you know, if it's in Biden's case, um, or the Democrats won't be trying to get elected for another four years, in Trump's case, he's in a second term, so I think that that wearing off can maybe start to cause the stock market to roll over a bit. Because I think it is riding that wave of stimulus. And last thing, just to get on the fiscal side, this is really remarkable. Maybe we'll talk about this more in depth in the next interview in two weeks. Right now, their uh, deficit in the states is going to be between 5.5 and 6 trillion this year, which is roughly 27 to 30 percent of GDP. That's almost twice as high as any deficit they ran during World War II. So just to put that into context, you know, when essentially the whole economy there was geared towards the war 
defeating the Nazis, etc. This one year of COVID has caused this ultimate in kind of this bailout economy. David, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. My guest has been David Skarika, founder of the Addicted to Profits newsletter online at addictedtoprofits.net. If you have any questions for David or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at House Street. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.